NDEs, psychedelics, spiral dynamics, napkin time with Keith. <laughs> Has Keith gone full heretic? Are we all God? What is the meaning of life? Is it 42? Here to join us to answer all these questions and more is Keith Giles, author of his latest book in the Sola trilogy, Sola Deus. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Yes. And so Keith, thanks for, for joining me in this conversation. Justin, thank you so much. That's a great introduction. That was a, that was a <laughs> wonderful little uh, bullet summary of the things that we talk about or that I talk about in that book. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Great to be back. And um, I want to say too, real quick too, last time I was here, I talked about Sola Mysterium and um, you gave me some great uh, references and people to go check out and talk to like Melissa Tears. Yeah, yeah. Um, and another guy who's also a, I can't remember his name. It's a really difficult name to pronounce. Uh, who's also a remember. hypnotist. And huh. um, Joseph something with a P, I think. Anyway. Wow, uh, now I don't you. even remember this stuff. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so thank you. No, it was helpful. And um, I, I was able to interview both of them and talk to them. And, and uh, all of that's going to end up in the the final the book in the in this sola trilogy uh, really? be about hypno hypnosis and the subconscious mind and uh all that kind of stuff well beautiful i'm i'm, I'm really looking forward to the third one you already have you already have that in mind it's already oh like, it's already oh, it's yeah, yeah yeah it's already outlined it's oh going to be God. called sola mesmera and uh yeah it's all and actually i'm really looking forward to that book because it'll be the first book i've written and published that has not a single reference to the Bible in it. And it's, I can't wait. <laughs> That's going to be fascinating. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, this one's probably been your most controversial. So yeah. far. Yes. To date, I would say definitely. Um, I mean, I had controversy. I talked, I opened Sola Deus talking about the controversy that I had coming out of Sola Mysterium. And, um, at the time, I wasn't super vocal about it, um, but I, I figured since I knew I was going deeper into the same woods on Sola Deus, I probably should just go in and say, uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of people that that walked with me throughout my other books, you know, the Jesus Un series. Um, they were with me all the way until I kind of got into the Sola Mysterium and now Sola Deus. And um, yeah, they just weren't willing to go there. You know, they... Uh, like my favorite criticism was like, you, you sound like Richard Rohr. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, no, no, I, I, I hate Richard Rohr. I'm like, well, there's our oh. problem right there. Wow. Wow, coming right out. So wh why do you think this one was the hardest book for you to write? Um, a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, the one, the most obvious one, I guess, is because of the subject matter. I mean, Soul in the Stream was really kind of just establishing that when we talk about God, we talk about theology, we're talking about something that transcends human comprehension, right? And so in this book, I still felt like there were some things unsaid in Solo Mysterium, and it is about God, but then like, again, I'm trying to use language to, to talk about something that's almost impossible to talk about. So it was just really challenging and difficult to find the language um, and all of that for, it's a, you know, it's just a really deep, confusing, maybe the most deep and confusing subject possible. But I think the, the other reason, and this is just my fault, um, every book I've ever written um, that I've published, the nonfiction stuff I've written and published, I, I always, I never sit down to write the book until I have an outline. You know what I mean? I, I know in advance with all my other books, this is the introduction. This is chapter one, two, three. I know every chapter, what I'm going to say, what I'm going to talk about. I have a notebook with all the stuff. I have a giant whiteboard where it's all like every chapter is broken down to all the basic things I want to talk about in every chapter. In Sola Deus, um, I made the mistake uh, of saying I had about half of it. And I thought, you know what, though? I think I think once I start writing the book, once I kind of really get into this topic, um, you know, I can find my way out of it. It's sort of like I had a map of how to get into the forest. And I just assumed that once I was about halfway into the forest, I could find my way back out. And that was not the case. I had literally wrote myself halfway into the book and was wondering, okay, what the hell am I doing? And how do I 
Where do I go from here? So that was part of it. I mean, I literally rewrote this book two times, maybe three times. Oh. And the final draft was like a third time through. Um, it was a pretty radical, some pretty radical rewrites. And some of the stuff at the end of the book, which we'll get into, which I think finally sort of like saved it for me. It was sort of like, okay, this is how I get out of it. This, this is where it goes next. Um, well, stuff that didn't come until like the third draft. So that's partly why I kind of made it hard on myself. I didn't mm -hmm. think it all through before I sat down to write like I've done in the past. I just sort of like, I'm going to just start writing and see where it goes. Well, I could. <laughs> so what do you, what probably, do you think? I probably won't do that again though. <laughs> <laughs> just off the fly. I'm, I'm curious, how has it been received so far? Uh, have people noticed and been like, oh man, this, this book, I can't even, yeah, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't, um, I will say, yeah, so far the, the response that I've gotten has been really great. You know, I, I always do like a, a book launch team, like I like 30 people in the, in the launch team. And, um, yeah, it's several of them, you know, as they're reading through it before it came out, um, publish, you know, like sharing in the private Facebook group that we have or sending me private messages just talking about how much it really helped them, you know, and how they really loved uh, what I was saying in the book. And so I didn't get any really negative feedback that way from anybody, any of the readers. Now that it's out, I haven't received any negative feedback. All the, the reviews, I think there's 20 something up there now. Um, they're all like mostly all five stars. There's one four star, but they're all positive. Um, you know, so that's good. And I, the, um, the thing I will say is that probably the most challenging for me was because I lost some, some of the, again, some of the people, some of the progressive Christian um, peers that I had when I was writing Jesus on, you know, um, I kind of lost them at Solo Mysterium. And so the challenge for me was like, how do I find any other authors willing to endorse this book, the Solo Deus, because it was so difficult at Solo Mysterium. And now the people that I would have gone to normally uh, you know, they're, they're not even available now. So I was really, it, so I was able to find some really, some people that were willing to take a chance. I mean, you know, Thomas J. Ord, uh, David Hayward, Heather Hamilton, Maria Francesca French, um, some, some really, some cool people, you know, were still willing to read it. And I want to say my favorite one, uh, well, the two of the, my favorite endorsement quotes came, one was Randall Rouser. Yeah. He was, he was, he was you know, again, he even said afterwards, he goes, I didn't agree with a lot of this, but he said, you know, I don't need to agree with someone to appreciate their thoughts and their, and you know, what they're doing. And, and Thomas J. Ord said the same thing. So, um, that was really cool. I really appreciated their willingness to, to, uh, take the book at face value and, um, and to say, yeah, uh, by endorsing this book, I'm not saying I agree with Keith on his conclusions. Right. But, you know, they appreciated that I was willing to go where I went and ask the questions that I asked and to help walk readers through, you know, some of my thought processes. And and I want to say real quick, too, I think that's probably if there's the feedback that I've gotten from most people. That's really which I think reflects what I was trying to do in the book is that um, I'm really careful throughout the book. Several times in the book, I will stop and talk directly to the reader and say, Hey, you don't have to agree with me here. Or, Hey, if this is, if I'm, if I'm pushing too hard in this direction and this is making you uncomfortable, it's fine if you just want to skip to the next chapter, you know? So, um, and so many, many of the readers and a lot of the feedback I've received have, have mentioned that and said they really appreciated that, that they, that, you know, that I understood that I was uh, into some new territory with some of my readers that might be triggering or scary for them. Um, and I did my best to do so in, in a way that honored them and didn't, you know, um, again, I, my goal in the book wasn't to like throw people deeper into some deconstruction uh, anxiety. So I was just trying to say, look, this is, these are things I'm thinking about. And um, you know, let's, let's just think about them together. Yeah. I actually appreciate that about the book. So you're like, Hey, look, I don't have everything figured out. I'm wrestling with all these different questions. You know, 
this is just me expressing my current thoughts and I'm mm -hmm. not trying to persuade anyone. I, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. 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 And I think I even say too, at one point in the book, like um, not only am I not trying to get you to agree with me, what I'm saying now uh, it's because I realized that a year from now I might change my mind again. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, Keith, I, <laughs> I think back to my more like conservative I would say evangelical days, charismatic evangelical days. And I can't believe that I'm here now. And so like, yeah. but when I was there, I was like, oh, I'll never leave Jesus. I will never, yeah. you know, whatever, deconvert or, yeah. you know. But it's just, it's just so crazy how we just keep on evolving and, and things change. Yeah. Hopefully for absolutely. the better. Yeah, no. I think so. I mean, yeah. Um, and I think where, I, where I'm ending up, you know, anyone anyone that reads Soledadeus will kind of pick up on the fact that I am moving into my post-Christian phase now and mm. um, being much more open to God being way more mysterious and different than I ever imagined. But, but in a way though, not, not limited, actually more, I feel like God is even greater, even more beyond I could, than what I could uh, comprehend. Um, but uh, yeah, moving away a little bit from the Christian specific Christian kind of, uh, theology and, and conversation, which again, this is the reason why I understand so many people that used to, they were with me before can't go this far with me now because I'm not interested in, I'm not a gatekeeper for Christianity. I'm not a spokesperson for Christianity. I'm not trying to get people like, no, 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 the Bible is really special or, oh no, no, Jesus is like, you know, the super amazing, you know, the only one or something like that. And, um, Oh, which, which, but I mean, I still appreciate Jesus. I love, I think Jesus is awesome. Um, Jesus is still kind of the, the touchstone that I have because I was raised, you know, in a Christian environment and, and I do, I do, and I, I, I see so much in Jesus that I think is commendable and, and amazing. Um, but I don't have any sort of exclusive feeling that, you know, Jesus is the only person we can learn some of the same things from, you know? Hmm. What would you say? Oh, well, actually, would you say that you're still a Christian? Would you still identify with that? You put me on the spot here. I, think, <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, to be honest, no, I guess not. Um, hmm. but, and for a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, one, just be honest, the word Christian, the label Christian, it mostly means, it mostly stands for some pretty toxic stuff nowadays you know what i mean um just like you know the, the exclusivity we're the only ones we have the truth and you don't we're going to heaven and you're not um all the way to like the you know uh, anti-women stuff and the uh, anti-lgbtq and all that and yes i know there are christians that that have moved away from that and that are not that way but um there's just so much of the Christian, the, 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 that term Christian, that it has so much baggage to it. I I really don't want to identify with that anymore. And um, I, But here's the thing. I don't know what to call myself. I mean, when you say post-Christian, I'm just saying what I'm not. I'm not I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, uh, and that's okay, too. I think, I, I think I'm really comfortable moving away from labels and stuff like that. Um, but I will say what concerns me about just coming out and saying that I, I wouldn't call myself a Christian anymore. Um, what concerns me about, about just saying that and owning that is, I mean, I don't want to let people down. I don't know any other, any other way to say it. I feel like I'm letting people down. And what I mean is mm -hmm. there are so many people that maybe they've just started reading the Jesus Sun books, you know, um, maybe they're looking into like my square one course that I do helping people go through deconstruction and things like that. And I still want to help people. I still, I still feel like I can, can walk people through whatever phase they're at in their deconstruction reconstruction journey. Um, and I, 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 I'm afraid in some ways by saying, Hey everybody, I'm, I'm post-Christian or I'm not a Christian anymore. That some of those people that I could help won't listen to me anymore. They're just like, Oh, that guy. Right. right. Oh, 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 he's not a Christian anymore. So I'm not going to read his book or I'm not going to um, I'm not going to take these courses that, that I that I know would really help you. In other words, like people associate, I think, too much um, 
they put too much weight, I think, on like, well, what do you believe? You know, that's why in Solar Mysterium, I kept trying to emphasize this idea of like, be your own guru. You know, stop looking for someone to follow and just be who you are. Figure out what you believe, not because I believe it or anybody else believes it. Um, you know, don't. So, for example, there's a. Um, I've, I've been going through the Gospel of Thomas, and I love it. I really love the Gospel of Thomas, and I'm writing. A, I'm writing a. Um, I'm publishing, volume one of a commentary on Thomas. It'll probably come out later this year. And as I'm going through Thomas, um, it's fascinating because about half of the sayings are from the Gospels that we already have. The other half are totally unique. But what I find is interesting is that once you figure out what Jesus is saying in Thomas, and spoiler, it's kind of like everything he's saying in Thomas is basically how uh, separation is an illusion and we're all connected to God and we're all connected to one another. I mean, that's the simple, the simple way to understand it. So if you read Thomas through that lens, and as I've been re reading Thomas through that lens, um, even when I read those sayings of Jesus that are already in the other gospels, but they don't have a narrative. They're not, there's no birth narrative. There's no, you know, crucifixion. There's no resurrection. There's no second coming. And it's just, a, it's just quotations of sayings of Jesus. That's it. And so when it's, when you just read the saying and it's not connected to any narrative. And then when you also read the saying and you're understanding, Oh, well, whatever this is, is something about, the illusion of separation and our connection with God and one another. Okay. When you read it through that, those filters, um, there's, there's a phrase that again, if you're a Christian, you've heard this before where Jesus talks about um, the blind leading the blind. Right. And, um, and in the, in the other gospels, it's in the context of basically the point is choose your, choose your guide wisely. Right. Because if you, if you choose the wrong guide and they're blind, they'll lead you into a ditch. You'll both fall into a ditch, right? So the takeaway from the other gospels in the, in, the, in the New Testament, when you read that saying is, just make sure you have the right guide or the smartest guide or the best guide, um, guru or whatever, leader, teacher or whatever. But when you read it through the lens of Thomas, through the things I just said, it what I realized, what, what I think Jesus is saying there is, only blind people need a guide. And it just hit me like, Damn, that's right. I'm not blind. I don't need someone to care to lead me around. You know, uh, I think Jesus is saying, if oh. you can see, if you, you know, again, do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? Okay, fine. Then follow the path. You got it. You don't need a guide. And so for, for anyway, maybe that's all my bias is coming in. But like I read that and I hear that. And I'm like, yes, only blind people need a guide. I'm not blind, so I can see for myself. And then that's what I'm trying to help people understand. And then again, but it's so hard, I think, especially for Christians, to not look for someone to be their guide or their guru, right? Brian Zahn, Brad Jerzak, you know, Richard Rohr. I mean, these are great people. I love them. I learn a lot from all of those guys. But, but you, I think we can take it too far. We get to the place of like, well, I believe that because Brian Zahn said, or I believe that because Richard Rohr said, yeah, but what do you believe in? Why do you believe it? Right. And, mm -hmm. and are you sure? Maybe they're wrong. How do you know they're, how do you so sure that they're right about that? Or me? So again, I, I don't want to be one of those people. I don't want them to say, well, Keith says, or, you know, I, I don't want to be anybody's guru. I want to help people think for themselves. I'd rather help people. I'd rather have people have eyes that are open so that they can see for themselves. And then they don't need me or anyone else to be their guide. Yeah. You know, I never actually thought about uh, the blind guide that way. Like, I never, it never even occurred to me. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. The only, <laughs> only blind people need guides, people who see, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. You know? And, so I, and again, I don't think I would have seen it if I wasn't in that place and, and could read it through that now from a totally different perspective. And it just, as I read it and I'm like, okay, again, I, I think I know what this is supposed to mean, I don't, but I don't want to borrow this from my Christian background. I want to just try to read this with fresh eyes. And then when I did, it was just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Who needs guides? Blind people. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, for me anyway, that that's where I'm at. And so to back it all the way up, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm only concerned about just saying to people, I'm not a Christian anymore, or I'm, I, I'm post-Christian or whatever. 
um, is that I feel like for some of those people, it's going to disqualify in their minds. It disqualifies me from being someone who could help them um, navigate some of these things. And that's fine too, I guess, in the long run, because there's, there are other people out there that I trust that I think are doing good stuff. Um, you know, so it doesn't have to be me, I guess, uh, as long as there's, as long as they find someone who will help them and there are other options. Yeah. I actually kind of have the same thinking. Like I try not to share too much about actually what I believe because <laughs> even I, I, there's a skeptical side of me that's like, Oh my God, Justin, you're absolutely uh, insane. Yeah. And I don't want to alienate people either. Right. You know? But um, yeah. And so. you also don't want to give people ammunition, right. To say, because mm. if you're saying that about yourself, right, man, I'm, I'm crazy. I, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a heretic. I'm out there like, well, just wait. Other people are going to hear you. If you did come out, they were like, oh man, they'll, they'll find even, even stronger uh, labels to put on you. And yeah, I understand that. Like, yeah, you, I, I don't want to, I don't want all of a sudden to have people like, oh, Keith is, he's a, he's an atheist or Keith is a, uh, agnostic or Keith is a post-Christian or whatever. Like I, I don't want those labels. Um, mm. I'd rather just be like, yeah, um, I guess I don't want any label at all, but you know, I, I doubt that's going to happen. People are going to find ways. <laughs> people are going to find yeah. ways to classify you and dismiss you. Yeah. Well, with that said, uh -huh. <laughs> what do you, what do you think uh, is the most controversial part of the book? Oh man the most controversial part of the book. Um, yeah. Well, maybe. <clears throat> okay, well, I think this is probably one of the most controversial parts of the book. And I, this is something that I have not read of anything else about in any other books. Um, where I, I have a whole chapter where I talk about the deification, uh, mm -hmm. the doctrine of deification from the early Christian church. I mean, on the one hand, it shouldn't be controversial because it's like in plain sight. It's all right there. Anybody that wants to study early church history, will you, you'll trip all over it. You can't miss it. Um, it. But it's controversial, I think, because no one does talk about it and nobody does want to go into that. So what I'm talking about is um, I just ran across so many quotes. For, I mean, for, for hundreds of years in the early church, like the earliest, um, you know, kind of theologians that we have and uh, Origen and Irenaeus and all these guys, and then all the way through to like um, Thomas Aquinas, like lots of these guys and a whole bunch of them in between. And just quote after quote after quote of them talking about how, um, you know, basically God became a man to make man God and we will be God and God will make us, you know, divine. We will, all this stuff. And again, it's, it's a concept that comes from the New Testament scriptures that he does say that, that, you know, as he was, we will be, and we're partakers of the divine nature and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, growing up Southern Baptist, no one ever preached a sermon on any of that. So I think for a lot of people, that part is probably a little controversial. Um, and they may not know what to do with that. Like, what is, what do I do with this new idea that God and humanity are, the same or one or, or, or that, that that's even possible. Um, so yeah, I think for a lot of people that will be a shock for them. Um, yeah. But that, that's know, the first thing that pops in my mind. Yeah. And I actually, that was one of my favorite chapters because I actually, I actually did believe that um, when I was a Christian at some point, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize how many, I mean, you, you had, you really did have quote after quote must have been at least a dozen in yes. plain like in plain sight yes. and i was surprised on how many of the church fathers uh actually yeah. affirm this so yeah. it's like this that's so weird like where like there's such a disconnect yeah um i don't know like why is that like literally <laughs> well i mean i think i know why yeah. um because i think around uh let's try to put a finger on it i would say i wanted to, i was going to say around the reformation but it may have started before that but at any rate, the more Christianity became more institutionalized, the more it became about growing the church and um, um, the more it became about uh, making Christianity stand out from uh, you know, other belief systems and things like that. And even just trying to 
define Christianity because again, in the early time, in, in the early days of, Christ, of Christianity, there were Christianities plural. There wasn't one. Of course, now we kind of have one main thing. And so it seems like there was always this push to like uh, whittle it all down and edit things out and just get down to this one thing. So I think that's part of it. But I think um, for me, I think part of the reason why that whole deification of, of humanity teaching kind of got buried was that, you know, Christian theology nowadays is much more interested in all of the ways we can talk about the same, the, all those same things, but make it only about Jesus. And so they would affirm all those things, but it's, but it's only true of Jesus, right? So it's all about sort of, um, they want to deify Jesus. They want, uh, and, but again, they, they want to restrict it to Jesus. They're not comfortable to say, well, what's true of Jesus is true of you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then even though Paul says that so many times, right? Because Christ was crucified, you've been crucified. Because Christ was raised, you've been raised. Uh, because Christ is at the seated at the right hand of the Father, you're seated at the right hand of the Father. Like he does it all the time, but like we're just we don't like that. We're not comfortable with that. And I think it's also Richard Rohr talks about this too, right? How um, we would we would much rather worship Jesus than to follow him. And in other words, so like, let's just take the red letters. What were the things that he said? Because the things that he talks about is really much more like, how am I loving other people, treating other people? How am I, how is my life reflecting sort of this image of God? Um, and, and yeah, if you worship Jesus, you don't have to follow him. <laughs> you don't have to take him. You don't have to take what he said seriously. Um, you can just like sing songs on Sunday morning for an hour and a half and, um, uh, underline things in your Bible and move on with your life. And um, so I, I don't know. I think that's part, partly why that, that whole teaching of the deification of man kind of, plus it's probably also because it sounds very Eastern, right? It sounds very, we would say new age mm. nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the other reason why it's like, Oh no, no, we don't want to, we don't want to get in that territory. We don't want to have to explain ourselves. Mm. But you, you, you go through this uh, diagram on a napkin Yes. That kind of uh, jump starts the whole book, and and uh, I feel like it's it was very controversial, actually. Yeah. <laughs> At the very end of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, the napkin thing is hilarious because, uh, uh, and I, I I I couldn't help but do it. You know what I mean? I was because I again I was trying to make sense of this idea of um, and that, with that very sort of central idea in the book, like. Um that we, or I, you know, I guess it starts off with me. I, I'm trying to understand how I am connected. Christ is in me and I am in Christ and Christ is in the father and the father's in me. And like, you know, and, and trying to conceptualize it almost like little Russian nesting dolls kind of thing. That's literally mm. in my mind, you know, where I first went to. So I literally was drawing on a napkin. Okay. Okay. Let me understand this. So here's God and then here's Christ and then here's me. Okay. Cause Jesus says this thing about, in, in, you know, in that day, you will realize that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me and I'm in you. And like, whoa, that's this mind-blowing idea. So I, I literally drew it on a napkin. But then, then you know, so I drew a box with God and a box with Jesus and a box with me. And I'm like, well, that's not, that's not accurate either because like God's not in a box. God is beyond. So I just took the box away from God. So, okay, God is out to the edges beyond. Okay. But then like, well, but that doesn't make sense either. Because, you know, God and Christ and, and God are also one. And so, like, so I took the box away from, from Christ. And then, like, then me. And, like, well, yeah, but but if but if I'm one with Christ and one with the Father the same way they're one with one another, there shouldn't be a box there either. So I took that box away. And then it still didn't make sense because I still had three words, God, Christ, me. But, but the concept isn't these three separate things. It's so I just made this gobbledygook, you know, I just put all the letters and just <laughs> shove them together. And as silly as that is, um, in some ways I feel like I know I did. I don't know if other people are this way too, but like I had, I think I almost had to go through that progression of thought. I couldn't have started at the last drawing on the last napkin. You know, I, I had to conceptualize it. Well, I think it's this and then go, well, no, no, that's not it. And then change it again. And then, well, no, that's not it. And, and, and in some ways, that's kind of a metaphor for the entire book. That's kind of what I'm doing through the whole book is we're like, uh, okay, I think it's this. 
But then when I when I step back and look at it, I'm like, well, no, I don't think that's it either. And I have to change it again and change it again. Because I do the same thing when I talk about um, panentheism, this idea that God is in all things, and had to differentiate that from pantheism, that God is all things. And I kind of do the same thing. I'm kind of like, well, but where does one end and where does the other begin? Like, and it feels, it seems like in some way there's still a separation there. And then like, well, what about me having a relationship or a connection with God? Well, that seems like separation too. And um, and then, yeah, I just kind of came, came down to the idea that I don't, it's, first of all, what am I doing drawing, trying to draw God on a napkin, <laughs> right? What am I doing? Uh, <laughs> and I literally just stopped like, in the book. I'm like, I can't believe I just drew God and tried to draw God on a napkin. Um, but again, it's like, we're, we're so limited by language and symbols and concepts. It literally is like someone in a two dimensional universe trying to understand and comprehend like a three dimensional or four dimensional, you know, being or drawing or space or object. And it, it is, it literally is impossible. So I, I, I think the, the answer, if there's an, I don't know if there is an answer, um, but what I kind of like landed a little bit was to say, whatever it is, whatever the truth is about God, when we're talking about God, I don't think it's panentheism, although I think some of that it gets it, you know, it is right on some levels. And I don't think it's pantheism, although I think some of those things are correct too. I think that it's some weird nebulous on the, like a Venn diagram between the two. And mm. I don't know what that is. You know what I mean? Uh, and, yeah. I, and I think that's, that overlap of pantheism and panentheism, it's not this, it's not that, it's something in the middle. And I, I again, I can't draw that on a napkin and I can't write, I can't put <laughs> words on a page that explain that. Yeah. But I, I think, I think at least right now, that's where I think, uh, conceptually, I think that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of philosophy and, and theology throughout the entire book. And I actually, I enjoyed that that wrestling with pantheism versus pantheism because i'm i'm sitting here thinking i'm like i'm not sure either right really i i i, I don't know if i consider myself a pantheist or a panentheist like I, I can see both sides right yeah and, and I, I, that's super controversial so yeah. yeah 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 and i think also in that same section of the book one of the things i was wrestling with was this sort of like classical theism which i inherited from christianity right um, and I'm definitely moving away from that. Like, I don't think God is up there somewhere. God is not some other being that I need to go, Hey, get his attention and, or her attention or whatever. Um, you know what I mean? Like, like, I don't, I don't accept that. I, whatever God is, I think it's way too mysterious, way more mysterious than that. And, um, so I'm rejecting this sort of idea of, of a kind of the classical deist idea of God uh, or theist idea of God. But, but again, at the same time, I I think whatever God is is in some way relational. And again, now I think I, I think now we're getting into this place of like a paradox or something like, mm -hmm. um, because a pure relationship concept is between one person and another person. But if I'm saying there's no separation, then what's going on there? And I don't know. But uh, but but at the same time, here here's what I think quantum science helps with. Um, because quantum science again would comes to the same conclusion that that everything is basically an expression of the quantum field. Um, it, we perceive everything as separate objects or people or things. Um, that's how we perceive the universe. It sure looks like there's separate stuff out there, individual things that are separate from one another. Um, but quantum science says no. That's that's kind of an illusion. The reality is everything is just a, an expression of that same quantum field. There's nothing but the quantum field. That's all there is. Um, so quantum science is saying the same thing. And yet within quantum science, I mean, how do we even get to quantum science? It was by us observing a particle, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, as a scientist is looking at these photons as they're going through the double slit experiment. And if they observe it, it behaves one way. And if they don't observe it, it behaves a totally different way. So observation, the relationship between me, an expression of the quantum field, and the photon, 
another expression of the quantum field, all the same thing, and yet something's going on there, right? So is everything the same one quantum field? Yes. But can there be relationship between individual expressions of the quantum field and other expressions in the quantum field? Absolutely. And does it make a difference if they are entangled or not entangled or if they observe or not observe? Absolutely. So again, we're left with this sort of paradox of on the theological side and on the scientific side, what are we talking about? How do we make sense of this? I don't know. I don't know that we ever will. Right. Um, but right. somehow both things are true. Yeah. You know, I feel like, and I don't know if I really believe in the Trinity or not, um, but I feel like the Trinity, if we were to use a Trinity as just like an analogy, mm -hmm. I feel like that could work, right? Like you're saying that all three persons are God and yet not God at the same time. And they're not and each other. Weird. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yet they, they're in relationship and yet they are all God, you know, they are all one, yeah. they're all God. So um, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Uh, no, I, see, that's exactly right, Justin. I think, um, I think that it's a helpful analogy or a metaphor. Um, and if we treat it that way, and what's also fascinating about the Trinity as a metaphor is that one of those three persons in the Trinity is a human. Right. Jesus has a physical body. And uh, in Christian theology, right, we're, we're, we're thinking of here's Jesus, a man. They, and, and we even talk about Christians even talk about how like, well, we're right now. Jesus in a physical body is before the throne of God and he has scars on his hand. And so he's still human. He's still physical. Um, and yet somehow he's part of this trinity of spirit and, and father and son. And they're all three one at the same time and yet not. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's a great analogy for exactly what we're talking about, right? So if if we're saying that could be true of Jesus, why couldn't it be true of us? And I would say, right. it, I think it is. I think wow. in some weird way, it's trying to tell us, uh, or it should be. Like we, if you just do the math, that you can say, oh, all of those things that are true of Jesus. So again, Paul says this all the time. Then they're true of us. Um, then some in some unexplained way because no one understands or can explain the trinity um those two things are true there's only one god right christians would trinitarians right no there's not three gods there's only one god yeah. but somehow mixed up in that one god is a human being <laughs> and then that human exactly. being though is a stand-in for every human being all these things that are said about jesus are true of you and me in fact we are the body of christ that's a metaphor one of the metaphors for, for people, right, uh, for Christians. So, although I think this applies to everybody, not just Christians. But I, again, I, I think these are helpful metaphors that help us kind of get to the same place uh, if we're willing to kind of go there. Yes. I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts of, like, I think of God as, as of right now, as transpersonal. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is God acts as both this impersonal force and also a person. Yeah. Which <laughs> I know that's contradictory, but it's like almost like beyond personhood. And that yeah. would theoretically explain why there's some, you know, spiritualities, religions that see God as an impersonal force. Yeah. Experience God as an impersonal force. And then obviously the Judeo Christian traditions, you know, it's a person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think I'm totally on board with that. I, I, um, that's kind of, or what I'm getting to in the subtitle for Solideos, you know, what if God is all of us? Hmm. And I kind of, it kind of came to me. I kind of had this epiphany. Um, I was actually having a conversation in our, in our square three group. Um, and we were talking about this and it's suddenly just like, it just kind of hit me kind of what you're saying. Like God is all of us. So God is all of us collectively. Um, and yet, again, we're getting to these crazy kind of concepts, right? So God is all of us, but then God is still one force, right? And yet, um, there's this crazy thing about God in this con in this way of thinking that even though God is this one sort of consciousness, I like the word consciousness. Um, God is like this ultimate consciousness in the universe that existed, by the way. 
for billions of years before a single human being ever popped up anywhere, right? At least on this planet. Um, and so in somehow God can be that conscious, that ultimate consciousness. And God at the same time is also every little individual consciousness, right? You and me and everybody who's ever existed all throughout time. And, but how does that work? I have no clue, but I, but I think in some ways I think both are true. Hmm. Is it arrogance and hubris to say that we are God? I, yeah, I don't think it is if what you mean, and because I think people hear it this way. If you still are thinking of God as up there, ultimate power, authority, you know, all the omnis, right? Omnipotent, omnipresent, like um, the God who breathed the universe into existence. If, if you're thinking of that and you say, I'm God, then what people hear is, oh, I'm that guy. I'm that guy that created everything. And I'm, I have ultimate power. And like, obviously you don't, but you know what I mean? But that's what they hear. They think, oh, you're saying you are the one true God. And, and so I think it's only hubris if you misunderstand it. I don't think most people are talking like you and I are talking. who are thinking the way we're thinking. We don't mean that. I don't mean that. I'm not, I do not, when I talk about me, like, Keith, as a being, as a consciousness, does not encapsulate that entire force. I'm not yeah. all of that. But uh, I think, how, how do I say it? Um, right, because Paul says this thing about um, God is the one in whom we, we all live and move and have our being. Yeah. Okay. But then I think you can flip that around and say, I am the one in whom God lives and moves and has being. Like without a physical body mine and yours and all the others, God doesn't live and move and have being. So there is this sort of symbiotic relationship between God and that, that ultimate consciousness and physical beings who incarnate a piece of, or a part of, or a, a reflection of that ultimate source. So, you know, it'd be like, it'd be like on one level, you know, if a drop of water could talk, and the drop of water said, I'm the ocean. Well, no, you're not the ocean. You're this little drop. But, you know, the ocean isn't the ocean without that little drop and a whole bunch of mm -hmm. other little drops. So you don't have an ocean without billions of drops. And and so in a way, it's, it's both true and not true. You know, is that drop the ocean? In a way, no, but in a way, yes. Right. 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 So I, I think it just, it's, it, it takes a little bit extra work to think it through, to think about it like that. Um, so the way the way I'm talking about it, when I say, um, although I'm not sure I would say I am God, but I would say <laughs> just embrace it, Keith. Yes, <laughs> I am. I am. I am. Um, uh, how would I even say it? Yeah, God. Yeah. I am not who I am without God. And in some ways, God wouldn't be who God is without me. Hmm. I think the, uh, the ocean analogy is a good one. You know, yeah. yeah. The drop actually contains the nature of the ocean, but it's not in the, you know, the entire ocean. Yeah. It Everything, still is the ocean. Yeah. Every single thing, if you just kind of had a microscope and you zoomed into that drop, there's nothing in that drop that isn't exactly a full, the full expression of everything you'd find in the ocean. Right. Um, other than like, you know, Sharks and whales and stuff, right? <laughs> but um, but yeah. So yeah, I, I, the other analogy I really like because because on, on on a different level, I think the fire analogy it, I like that one better because the fire analogy is like so if you had one, even if you just had a like I struck a match, right, and I go this little tiny flame, I could light a hundred billion other matches or just sticks or, you know, any, any uh, candles from that single flame. And it would, it would still be there. It would not, it doesn't diminish in any way. Like, you know, you put your candle in, now you got a flame and then somebody else. And I did that a hundred billion times. Mm -hmm. It's not all of a sudden, Oh, I'm running out of fire. Oh, it's, 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 it's running out. I'm, I'm I, cause I've given away all this fire. No, th that flame exists and can be exponentially multiplied, you know, infinitely without in, without any changing anything about the nature of that flame. And I think I say that in the book too, like all flame is the same flame, right? 
So any of those other, so it, again, perceive, we perceive, um, wow, there's a whole bunch of candles here. They're all different. Everybody's got their own little flame. Well, really reality, no, we all have the same flame. It all, we all took from the same source and it's just that same source multiplied. Um, so I like that analogy too. I think there's something really interesting about that. Hmm. So what you talk about spiral dynamics, which I was very surprised that you mentioned spiral dynamics, you know, near death experiences, psychedelics. Um, oh yeah. That's where I get really weird. <laughs> oh yeah. Where, where does psycho, uh, excuse me, spiral dynamics actually play into all of this and what is it? Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's one of those ideas that kind of came near the end of the book where, uh, as I was writing the book, um, I was kind of like, what, what makes sense? You know, um, like what's, what's another way to express this? And I had come across biodynamics um, a few years ago. And I think when I first came across it, I was like, oh, that's interesting. But I was writing this book and I was kind of like, okay, I think that's a wonderful mechanism for helping us understand um, how we as individual people, as well as we as humanity on this planet um, have developed and gone through sort of stages of consciousness, stages of development. Um, so it was super helpful, helpful for me to really look at that and recognize that we're on this progression and, uh, and this development. Like I feel like if, if God is what we're talking about, right? God is this ultimate consciousness. We are expressions of that God. It feels like um, that consciousness and that consciousness that's in us is very patiently and slowly, but inevitably leading us to an awakening of that reality that we are one <clears throat> with God and we are one with one another. Because the ultimate stage of biodynamics um, well, I shouldn't say the ultimate. It's the it's the one we can see on the horizon, <clears throat> and we and we've experienced it in some measure. So a lot of people will say that there are probably levels beyond uh, that ultimate level that we call turquoise, or I call it like the Christ consciousness level. Um, it's just that we've not we haven't seen it yet. We have seen no examples of it yet. Um, but essentially, I mean, it's it's difficult to talk about it all in the book. But essentially. Um, Spiral dynamics walks us through these little stages of like the initial stage is sort of the me stage. It's all about you and your survival and, you know, humanity kind of like think about cavemen or something, you know, uh, they have to eat, kill and eat and survive and, and mate and reproduce. And it's all about that. And so every, their, their whole mindset is totally into this. It's all about them. And then later on, they might develop some connections and tribes. And so then it's like, maybe it's, maybe it's us a little bit, but then there's still a them. We got to watch out for them, right? And then so spiral dynamics kind of walks us through these stages. We can map it on human history. We can say, okay, at this stage is when we sort of entered into like, let's say the industrial age. And this is where we're focused on, you know, uh, like more like capitalism. We're earning, we're, you know, we're trying to make better lives for ourselves. We're not worried about survival anymore. Um, and then maybe you reach a stage where you realize that we're at that stage. We're like, hey, for me to be, enjoying all this good stuff and comfort that I'm enjoying. I'm noticing other people are not, that's not cool. Maybe I need to help them. I need to share some of what I have with them. Right. So that's when you move like into what we call like a green stage. And again, we can see throughout history where we've done that, right. Where societies have done that, where individual people have behaved that way and thought that way and sort of come to this new consciousness, this new level of like, Oh, I'm moving away from this and I'm moving into this other thing. And so, What's really encouraging to me is to see that as, as you follow that spiral dynamics progression, you end up moving into this stage, the turquoise stage, which is this realization of we are all connected and we all need one another. And it make, just makes sense for all of us to cooperate and to care for the well-being of other people. And for me, it's just astounding how much that mirrors the kind of things that Jesus talked about. In fact, I feel like until you reach that level of consciousness, you really won't be able to love your enemy as yourself mm. because you won't see yourself in the other person, right? But that's the right. minute you can see yourself and God, the same God that's in you is in that other person. Like I'm, I'm just as connected to them as any, as anything else. Then, oh, well, then if they're starving, I'm going to feed them. If they're, if they need shelter, I'm going to care for them. If they're, they're not my enemy. I can't kill. How, I, how can I kill myself? I got to kill someone that 
you know, has this exact same essence that I do. Um, and again, we, we haven't seen societies reach that level yet, but we definitely have individuals that we can point to to say, okay, that person, that individual person, they got there. They got to that stage and they realized that and then they behaved a certain way. So it kind of gives us a model of, okay, that's how we would do this. This is how we would behave this way. Um, and so if the day does ever come, I think right now we can only point to maybe the green stage uh, humanity has reached at this point in, in sort of organized ways. Um, so we're not there yet, but boy, look back behind us. We've made a whole lot of progress. I, agree. Uh, I feel like in some ways too, lately we're, we're going back. We're maybe back to going back into the red stage and we're very yeah. warlike and tribalistic and, you know, um, so, but, you know, but at least we've been there and we kind of, there's hope we could get back to that. And then even more hope that we could get beyond that. Um, so that just gives me a lot of hope for, for humanity. It feels, it gives me hope that we are, we have gotten it. Some of us have gotten it. We can get it. And maybe we reach a tipping point at some, at some place in the future where, we really do get this stuff. And then all that stuff that Jesus was talking about finally clicks, right? All that Sermon on the Mount stuff. Um, we kind of go, oh, you know, this does make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it gives me some hope. How do we move from this, you know, the bottom stage where we're, uh, it's all about survival. It's all about me. Yep. It's all about the tribe. How do we move up uh, and progress into the yellow and turquoise about interconnectedness, Christ yep. consciousness, what have you? Yeah. So yeah, I tried to think about that in the book and talk about that in the book. And so again, just kind of looking on the individual level, um, there's a couple of different ways that people seem to have done that. Um, one level on one, one level is simply just frankly having someone show you the spiral dynamics, you know, the whole thing, like teach you the whole thing. And like, you can, you start connecting the dots like, okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, I as an individual, I, I used to be that way, but then I, I changed and now, okay, I could, maybe I'm in the, the, the blue stage or maybe I'm in the red stage or maybe I'm in the, oh, maybe I'm in the yellow or, or, the, or the green stage. Okay, but you can, you can acknowledge like, yes, this is a normal, this is a developmental stage, stages that humans go through. Um, so sometimes that's helpful because it just, it, it just creates this kind of aha, like, oh, and so I've made this progress here but then this is where I still need to grow. And now I can start thinking about that or focusing on that. So that's one way. Um, in the book, I, I give several examples of people um, who have kind of reached that, kind of like leapfrogged over some of those stages and found themselves in the yellow or the, or the turquoise stage. Um, for some of them, it's um, you know, like a near-death experience. Um, and I, I give a couple of examples of those. I, uh, for some people, it's just a spiritual epiphany. Like you're not even thinking about it. It's just like, and it hits you out of the blue, like, oh my gosh, you know, wow. And then once you get there, you kind of don't lose it. You kind of like, oh, oh, this is, this is some new, interesting, fascinating reality that I, now I need to start thinking from this direction. Um, for some people, frankly, it's uh, psychedelics. And uh, I talk about that. I have some examples in there of some people, again, who weren't, didn't believe in God, didn't believe in connectivity, didn't believe in any of this kind of mumbo jumbo metaphysical new age stuff. And then they have a profound experience um, on ayahuasca or mushrooms or something like that. And the, and even after they come out of it, they're convinced like, Oh yeah, there, this God is all around us and I'm, I'm part of God and God isn't everybody. And it just shifts their way of thinking. So there's a, you know, there's different ways I think for us to get there. I don't think it really matters how you get there. I think the important thing is that we do reach this place of, of recognizing that. Um, so yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully one way or the other, we get there. Yeah. I, I have to ask, have you had a psychedelic experience before? I have not. Um, I talk about it a lot. People probably think I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll just say, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Like, you know, if okay. I had a friend who was like, Hey, dude, I got some some mushrooms. And you want to check them out? I'd probably be like, "Yeah, sounds cool to me." Um, but uh, you know, I guess in one hand, on the one hand, though, I kind of appreciate that I don't I don't feel like I need to have that experience because I kind of I'm I already get that. I mean, maybe it would make mm -hmm. it more profound. Maybe it'd be even more amazing if I 
had that deeper experience of it. I feel like I've had experiences, um, sort of spiritual experiences. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't had the psychedelic experiences myself. Got it. Okay. I had to ask. <laughs> have you? <laughs> I have. And? And they're profound. They're yeah. absolutely profound. That's um, what I've heard. And, and they're, they're being used for, you know, uh, their psychedelic assisted therapy. Yes. Great, great results with that. But oh, I yeah. will say, and, and by the way, you know, we are not condoning the use of illegal <laughs> substances. You know, sure. you're, we're all adults here, you know, sure. we're not condoning anything. I'm just sharing my experience. Um, right. Yeah, no, there's been profound, profound uh, insights. Yes. I think for me personally, I don't know if the, I think the psychedelics have assisted with with therapy. I don't know if I've had any like crazy lasting breakthroughs for okay. me personally, but yeah. man, it felt like I came out of the matrix. It felt yes. like we were all one. Like I didn't actually, I didn't feel like we were all one. It was just like this weird knowing. Yes. Insight. I'm just like, it's oh just yeah, like of course. Something clicks and you're like, yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I get it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, I will say yeah. be careful because yes. these are powerful substances. So, you know, don't abuse them. I will say Yeah, that. no, and, and I think that's fair to say too, because um, some people do have really positive experiences like that, but some people don't. Some people have yes. very negative experiences. Yeah. Um, what I've heard too, though, the people that I've watched or, you know, interviews and things I've read of people having those experiences, whether good or bad, um, it seems like, and I, by the way, I do know some people who all actually do, the mushroom thing on a regular basis, microdosing and things like that. Nice. Um, but, you know, a lot of them have said that those experiences are so profound and so intense. Like you're not doing this at that level every day. No. I mean, you can't, you can't like, no way, uh -uh. like uh -uh. maybe like once a year I'll do that, you know, because uh -uh. it's so intense and so amazing. Like, and you kind of don't need it all the time. So it's not like, um, yeah, you're not like, you're not like addicted to this or something. And, no. um, but I've been so, it's so amazing to me how it seems that it does have such therapeutic um you know aspects to it even even to the level of like people that are addicted to like heroin and things like that have been able to use um mushrooms and things like this some other psychedelics to, to yeah. get off of that um yeah so it just breaks their addiction as well which is really fascinating it is i think it's uh, it's very exciting and hopefully just my opinion i, I hope that these things are uh, legalized and regulated and, I agree. and used. Yeah. I agree. So, uh, all right. So I have a hard question because let's say we agree with all, all of this, like God is in all and is all, and we're one with God. We're all one. Yeah. Um, that means Keith, that serial, serial killers, yes. Pedophiles, dictators, yes. mass murderers, all mm. kinds of evil people. Yes. Are one with God and, we're one with them. And so yes. what do we do with that? Yeah, that's the uh, that's the hard part of it, isn't it? I remember my my thing was when I first really started uh, embracing that idea that I'm one with everyone and we're all one with God like that was like, oh, so I'm one with God and so is Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so am i and i guess i'm in some weird way connected to, to donald trump and like you said serial killers and pedophiles and all this stuff um yeah that is a that is a, a sobering thought uh, i do talk about it in the book a little bit like what do we do about that you know like well because I, I i should say i think most of the time when that fact is brought up it's typically brought up and uh, to challenge the notion. It's trying to say, oh, that can't be true, Keith, because you know we can't all be connected to God like that. Because what do you do? But what about rapists and murderers and all this stuff? Um, like, I don't think that's an argument against this idea. Um, I think what it is is a is a it's evidence that we not all of us have awakened to this reality, right? So if you still are operating under this illusion. Like go back to this biodynamics thing. You're you, you're back into the the beginning stage, right? You're in the me stage. You're in stage one. It's all about you and all you care about and your survival. And I don't care about anybody else. And I'll do whatever I whatever it takes to get what I want, whatever pleasure I want, whatever you know, whatever I whatever I desire. I'm just gonna get it and have it. Um, it doesn't mean that someone at that level isn't connected to God. It just means they are completely clueless to it. And so. You know, I think 
helping people get that is is a good thing. Um, again, I think the more we move into those other those later stages like yellow and turquoise and things like that, we become people who can't do those things. We can't operate in those ways. We can't harm other people. Um, and so the only reason we're harming other people this way is because we're oblivious to these things, right? We bought into this illusion that, you know, it's just about me and there is no connection. There's no, there's no transcendent uh, reality beyond this one. And so, yeah, that's what I would say. And I know for a lot of people that's not comfortable. They still don't like it because it's like, yeah, yeah but, but I'm still connected to this. Yes, yes, we are. And maybe what it, what that means is that we have, um, for those of us who, who do recognize that, um, it kind of gives us a little bit more responsibility than for those people who are connected to God and are connected to us and are behaving in those ways that are destructive and and violent and, you know, um, and evil and find ways to alleviate that and change that and heal that. Hmm. So once we, we read this book, where do you think this takes us? Now that, hmm. you know, maybe we're, we're contemplating the idea that we're all one. God is in us. God is us. Hmm. Where do we where do we go from here? Well, I wish I knew, because um, <laughs> <laughs> um, to me the journey is still ongoing. Um, I guess for me, where I where I am now, um, it's really just trying to press deeper into the reality of that connection with God and one another, right? It, it because it has it has pretty deep implications then because I do I I think that I do have a responsibility um not because the bible says so or because Jesus said so but because this is the, this is the ultimate reality of of the universe that I have this deep connection to to other human beings in this powerful profound deep way and other living things um that then well what do I do well then I I want to live from this place of of that reality, which means then, you know, I would do for others what I would want them to do for me. I would, uh, I would want to treat people the way I want to be treated. I, I, I want to, um, to bring light and healing and love and, you know, joy and purpose to all the other expressions of me and God that I, that I encounter. Um, and so how do I do that? Well, you know, that's something I kind of figure out on a daily basis. So I maybe mean, in some ways, then what I'm saying is, um, I guess you could, you could probably, um, live the same kind of life and have the same kind of goals and, and, uh, purpose for your life. If you weren't someone like me who has decided he's post-Christian, because you could say, well, Jesus did this and the Bible says this. And they're like, well, okay, great. Then good. Go ahead and do that. That's great. Um, the difference is that when I was doing those things and operating out of that Christian mindset, it, was, it wasn't, it was though, from the mindset that I was connected to every other human being. Like, for me, recognizing that connectivity and that oneness allowed me to relate to other human beings as another human being. I don't relate to people now as are they a Christian? Have they prayed the prayer? What do they believe about this or that? Like, I don't, none of that matters. Yeah. Um, so that that's one positive difference, I think. But, you know, at whatever level we can operate from a place of love, from a place of recognizing um, the responsibility that we have to, for one another uh, during our lifetime. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, do you have any um, closing thoughts for people who are watching? Well, I, I guess, yeah, uh, something similar, I guess, that I said in the previous book, um, I'm just more convinced of this than I was before, that, that when we're thinking about God, that we learn how to embrace this mystery of God, that we don't have ideas of God or versions of God that separate us from other people, Um that we hold loosely to those to those dogmatic ways of thinking, 
Um, you know, I say this, I say, I say this all the time. You know, so many people right now are going through their deconstructing phases and deconstructing their theology and all that. And I always say, you know, in all of your deconstructing your theology, deconstruct your need to be right about everything. And I think the more we do that, the more we really get comfortable not having all the answers, not having all everything figured out and mapped out. Um, I think we have so much more freedom. And I think mm -hmm. we have so much, we have more capacity for love and joy and connectivity with other people and things like that. So uh, I would just encourage listeners to keep moving in that direction. Um, keep asking questions and don't let the cement dry so quickly. Uh, most of us sort of like, I did a Google search. I watched a YouTube video. I know, now, here's my answer. I now I know. No, right, right. you have an answer, you have an idea. But you know, stay open to other possibilities that are out there. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I haven't got it figured out. I'm still on the journey, and I think it's important for us to stay, continue to stay in that place of questioning, embracing mystery, and admitting none of us has it all figured out. I absolutely agree. I agree. And so, guys, uh, get the book. I will have the link in uh, the below description. The show Hello. notes or whatever, yeah. And if uh, anybody wants to reach out or get your other books, uh, consume your content, how can they contact you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd love to connect with people. So I'm on all the social platforms. I'm on Instagram. Yes, even Twitter, Facebook, <laughs> um, YouTube, all of that. And um, yeah, if people read the books, have questions about things, I'm happy to interact with them. Um, all my books are on Amazon. Um, paperback, Kindle, and Audible. This new book will be on Audible probably in about another month or so. And um, yeah, I do some podcasts. I have a podcast called Second Cup with Keith that I do. And uh, I'm also on Heretic Happy Hour with some other friends of mine. And uh, Matthew DeStefano and I do Apostates Anonymous. So lots of content, lots of stuff out there to, to check out. And uh, yeah, I would love to interact with people if they have any more thoughts about this subject. And are you going to be voicing your your book? Would that be your voice? No, you know what? It's too much trouble to do uh, to do your own Audible. But I have found a guy that I really love. His name is Eric Morrison, and he's done all of my Jesus Sun series. He did Solo Mysterium. Um, nice. He's my go-to guy. Like when I listen back to my words and him reading them, I, sometimes I'm like, "Oh my gosh, did I say that? It sounds so great." <laughs> yeah. He he does a better job than I could do. I think so. I like it. Yeah. Awesome, Keith. This is. Really a great conversation. I feel like we're vibing on some similar levels. Yeah, yeah. So I appreciate I so. it. Yeah, thank you, Justin. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, guys, again, get the book. Uh, link is in the description below. And until next time.